so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters this podcast was recorded on. A warning, this episode does include graphic descriptions of violence against children. Please take care while listening. It's 5.40pm on July 5th, 2018, in the leafy Sydney suburb of West Pennant Hills. The normally quiet suburban Hull Street is full of police cars and ambulances. Olga Edwards is just getting home from work. Panicked, she realises the lights and sirens are in front of her home, the one she shares with her children, 15-year-old Jack and 13-year-old Jennifer. As she rushes towards the front door, she notices her daughter's school bag and laptop inside and yells at an officer, "'What are you doing in my house? Why are you here?' As she frantically calls her kids' mobile phones, police inside are confirming the worst. Both of Olga's children have been murdered. As she'll soon find out, Jack and Jennifer were shot dead while cowering in her son's bedroom underneath his desk. Jack died trying to protect his little sister with his body, but they had no chance of surviving the violence inflicted on them. As she waits for police to update her, Olga already knows who's responsible for whatever evil has happened inside her house. She knows there is only one reason police will be at her doorstep. It's my husband, she tells them. It's my husband. We have the final court hearing in two weeks. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. This Domestic and Family Violence Prevention Month, we're digging into our archives to revisit crimes that should have changed everything. Jack and Jennifer Edwards had long feared their violent and unpredictable father. Jack used to sleep with a baseball bat. His father had punched and kicked him once for playing with his phone without permission. On a family trip to Paris in 2015, he'd held him against a wall by his neck. It was so brazen and public, it was passers-by that had to intervene. Jennifer vowed to never turn her back on her dad. In one incident, when she was only 10, she was slapped across the face for not sleeping. Jack died in 2018 at the hands of his father after being shot 19 times. His sister were shot 31 times. Their father was in and out of their home within two minutes and 11 seconds of arriving. An hour after returning home from murdering his children, he shot himself, but not before one final sinister act. When police arrived, they found a black T-shirt on a wire hanger at the foot of his bed. World's greatest daddy, it read. He wasn't supposed to even know where his kids were living. But police found Jennifer's train timetable and movements printed on a piece of paper in his pocket. They suspect he hired a private investigator. While handing down her findings into their deaths, coroner Teresa O'Sullivan said they should not be categorised as tragedies because to do so would suggest nothing could have been done to change the outcome. The reality was they, and their mother, were failed by multiple agencies. Their deaths were very much preventable, and perhaps the most glaring failure of all was the fact Edwards was granted multiple gun licences in 2017, lawfully purchasing guns, including the one he used to kill his children, when there was a long, documented history of abuse against him. Olga was his seventh partner, with police records showing allegations of violence and stalking had been made against him in relation to four of his previous partners and one of his other ten children. Five months after her children's murders, Olga took her own life. Life was too hard without Jack and Jennifer. Before she died, she gave a statement to the coronial inquest. She wrote about how Edwards controlled every aspect of her life down to what she wore and how she styled her hair. She detailed years of abuse against both her and their children. She wrote about her fear that they would end up dead at the hands of their father. She wrote about her multiple desperate attempts to get help. 
In 2019, Jesse Stevens sat down with Sydney Morning Herald crime reporter Sally Rawsthorne to talk about this horrible case. And a note, the coronial inquest's findings in this case were handed down in 2021. So a lot of the court detail and prior DV history was not yet known during this conversation. Here's Jesse. I'd like to begin with who John Edwards was. So if we'd met him prior to 2018, what sort of person was he described as? Well, people who knew him, who we obviously only spoke to after the tragic shooting occurred, we never spoke to anyone before. We didn't speak to anyone who sort of maybe considered him a friend or anything like that. But from what I can tell, he was a very sort of reclusive man, quite harsh on his children is what a lot of people said to us. They said that Jack in particular, his son, really copped it a bit from him. He was not very affectionate, not a very particularly loving person. They said that he had difficulty relating to his children and wasn't very warm with them, nothing like that. We were told that he bought a border collie for Jennifer when she got into a selective school in Sydney. So sort of maybe had a bit of a transactional relationship with his children. I don't know, maybe that was just that he couldn't relate, didn't know how, but no one sort of spoke of him in glowing terms. No one that I spoke to, and obviously having interviewed people after a murder-suicide, they don't tend to speak of people in glowing terms, but no one sort of had a great deal of kind things to say about him or nice In terms of his work, he was a financial planner for 37 years. He worked for himself, so there was no kind of colleague saying, oh, he was like this at work or he was friendly or he talked about this or anything like that. He seemed like a very sort of quite isolated man who tended to really keep to himself. After their relationship broke down, he stayed in the family home and she moved to the next suburb, maybe the one after that. And he stayed in the house, but it went to rack and ruin a bit. The neighbours said that the pool was covered in algae and there was rubbish everywhere. It got a bit unsafe towards the end. They said there were bottles in the grass and sort of bits of glass and it didn't sound like a very inviting place and the sort of place that you definitely wouldn't want to go. With Olga, as you mentioned, so she was about 19 when she met him and I think he was in his late 50s. So mm-hmm. there was sort of a significant age gap there. What do we know about how they met and the relationship that ensued? Do we know much about whether that was functional in the early days? I don't actually know. I don't know how they met each other. She was from Russia and I don't actually know what brought her to Australia. She was a solicitor. She worked at sort of a mid-sized suburban firm and was highly regarded there, very well liked, very popular. But in terms of their relationship with one another, I don't actually know how it started or how it was in the early days. What we do know is that it ended in family court proceedings over the children and where they would live, who they would spend time with, which parent they would have holidays with and that sort of thing. And it ultimately culminated in Olga getting full custody of the kids and John not getting any. Was it suggested in those proceedings that John wanted some sort of custody or wanted that relationship or was that unclear? I don't know, actually, as we shouldn't be. We're not allowed access to any family court proceedings or anything like that. So I don't know. I wouldn't be able to tell you. Just know that it was in the courts. Yes. Yeah. So we therefore don't really have a sense then of how amicable the divorce was other than the fact that the children were basically only with their mother. Exactly. And it was before the family court, which suggests it was acrimonious in some way. Some people, if they split up, they can make those decisions without going through the legal system, without going through mediation or anything like that. But the fact that they were in the court means that there was some sort of tension there. Do we know anything else about what the relationship was between the children and John after the divorce in terms of whether they wanted to spend time with him or anything? It's hard to say. No one has said to me they were really fond of their father, they enjoyed spending time with him, but nor has anyone suggested that, you know, they were forced to spend every so often with him and they hated it or anything like that. As I mentioned before, he did buy his daughter a border collie as a reward for getting into a selective school, which sort of suggests that they spent some time together or he was hoping to spend some time with them. Neighbours and people who knew the family said, though, that he was very harsh on those two children, particularly on his son. One of the people who I spoke to in the course of reporting this story mentioned an incident in a restaurant in Paris where apparently he had his son by the throat up against the wall following some sort of argument. So I don't know, I wasn't there, but it doesn't sound like it was a particularly healthy, loving, happy relationship. They were living in West Pennant Hills with their mother, Olga. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about what sort of suburb that is in terms of if, if you, you know, didn't live in Sydney, how would you describe it to sort of an outsider? 
West Bennett Hills is very suburban. It's very quiet. There's a lot of families there, nothing in the way of nightlife, nothing like that. It's quite an affluent area. There's a lot of schools, a lot of private schools around that area as well. It's very family oriented. They moved there after the separation, actually. They'd grown up in Normanhurst, I think, which is just 10 kilometres or so down the road. And it's quite similar. It's on the outer edges of Sydney and very family focused, very suburban, very quiet, lots of trees. Certainly not the sort of place that you'd expect something like this to happen. On the 5th of July 2018, I believe it was, Olga returned home after work and she saw police cars outside her home. Was it that they said something to her before she even jumped out of the car? How was that handled? I do know she was treated in hospital for shock as soon as that happened. I think she spent the night in hospital and was then released into the care of friends. But obviously unimaginable, just so horrific for her. The police and the ambulances who attended the scene themselves were quite distressed, I'm told. What they found, obviously, in that bedroom was extremely horrifying for them, just terrible and awful, not something you'd ever want to see. So I imagine for her it must have just been unbearable. Returning to our breaking news now, the double shooting tonight in Sydney's northwest. Paul Caddock is once again in the newsroom with more details. Paul, what's the latest? Well, Mark, we now know it is two children who have been shot dead at a home in Hull Road in West Pennant Hills. What's not yet clear is how old they were or exactly how this has unfolded. The first calls to emergency services came just after 5.20 this evening. Police arrived first at the scene and called in paramedics to treat a woman described as hysterical. There's still no official word on who pulled the trigger and whether police are now actively searching for someone. And what had happened that day to those children? So they got home from school and they were at the house that they'd been living in with their mother, the rental house in West Pennant Hills, and their father arrived in his white Commodore, I believe it was, and went into the house and then when they heard gunshots, neighbours called the police and they arrived at the home with ambulances to find the bodies of those two children inside. Senior police sources told me after the fact that Jack died trying to stop his dad from shooting his sister. The police said that they're very powerful handguns. They didn't release any more detail on what sort of guns they were. They try and keep that sort of thing fairly close to their chest for obvious reasons. But subsequent to that, because his body wasn't there, they didn't know where he was, they launched an enormous manhunt and it sort of culminated about 4am with police helicopters over the house at Normanhurst with the lights going through their windows, someone over the loudspeaker saying, come out, come out, you know, surrender. And when that didn't happen, they went into the house and found his body as well. Did they know immediately who had done it? I don't think they knew, but I think they had a fairly good idea. From memory, the release they issued at the time said he's not a danger to the public but is also not someone that you want to trifle with. So if you see him, please ring triple zero immediately. But they weren't issuing warnings that there was a gunman on the loose or whatever. They knew it was very targeted and very intentional and very much focused just on the people that were involved. And was there a sense that this was premeditated? Because obviously... It's almost like he's worked out that there's a time that Olga comes home from work and there's this window. Mm. Was that believed to be intentional? I'm not sure in terms of the actual timing of the events on the day, but police at the time did say it was very much a planned, premeditated, intentional attack. They thought from evidence that they'd gathered, they never revealed what that was because there's no criminal proceedings afoot for this because obviously everyone involved is dead. They did flag that it was very much a planned, premeditated attack. Murder of a young brother and his sister in Sydney shot dead by their own father who then took his own life. In an unimaginable shock, the mother of the 13 and 15-year-olds returned home last night to find out her children were dead. This morning, police swarmed on a street in Normanhurst, just six kilometres from the crime scene. This is such a safe community and, like, this is kind of terrifying. And I don't know why someone would do this. <coughs> Couldn't believe it. Oh. Kids just uh, oh, so innocent that they are. Police went in and found his body. Edwards had turned the murder weapon on himself. This is 
something that has been premeditated and planned. There were a number of firearms that he had ownership and control over, and only two of them um, were located at Normanhurst. The mother is being treated for shock and is being cared for by friends. Do we know how this man who's living in the suburbs, who I believe was retired at the time, had access to a gun? So in New South Wales, you can have a gun if you have a licence for yourself, sorry, and if that gun is registered. So what happened in this particular instance, or what happens in any instance actually, if you go to get a handgun licence, is you go to a gun club in your suburb or the closest one or whatever you want, and there you fill out a form that's called a P650 form. And on that form, you have to include information like any personal information about you, like any family violence histories, any criminal matters, any ABOs in the past 10 years, any mental health problems, that sort of thing. You fill out this form and if there's no issues, then you can go on to start training for your gun licence. But in this case, there were several red flags that were raised in terms of past history, in terms of ABOs, in terms of violence, family matters before the court, that sort of thing. And then what happens is the gun club then has to reject it. You also have to put in the form whether you've been rejected by another gun club. And the gun club rejects it and then you can appeal to get what's called a commissioner's permit. And with that commissioner's permit, it kind of overrides the form. Like if you fail on your form, you can then appeal, go to the firearms registry and appeal. And that's what happened here. So he was initially rejected by the Karingai Shooting Club, which is quite close to where he lives. And then after that happened. He he made an appeal for a firearms licence through the registry and was successful. So then went on to train and gain a gun licence at the St Mary Shooting Club. And through that, he was licensed to own those guns, to use those guns, obviously not in that way, but at a shooting range or whatever. And the two guns that were used in the attack were actually both registered to him. Wow. That's really interesting because he was, as you say, legally allowed to have those guns. Exactly. Do we know why that second decision was made? We don't, no, and we probably never will. The father who shot dead his two teenage children in Sydney's northwest reportedly harassed gun club officials in a bid to get a firearm. The Daily Telegraph reports John Edwards sent a letter to Karungai Pistol Club in 2016 asking them to accept him as a member in the spirit of Christmas. He also said he was a former military man and volunteered for the SES and Rural Fire Service, but failed to mention his custody battle with his ex-wife. When his bid was rejected, Mr Edwards reportedly began calling the club's secretary and president, demanding to know why. The 67-year-old shot dead his 15-year-old son and 13-year-old daughter in their West Pennant Hills home on July 5th. What was the community response? As as you say, this is a community that's often very quiet and suburban and Mm. doesn't have a high crime rate generally, especially something like this would shock any community in the country. But how did they respond with the news of this? Well, everyone was, as you can imagine, just devastated, completely beside themselves over this just horrendous news. There was a big outpouring of support, particularly from the Russian community for Olga, because she was also Russian. And so she was released into the care of friends after she was hospitalised and she spent a lot of time with her friends. She was very much supported within the community. And then in terms of grieving, I went to the school that Jennifer had gone to the next day and you could barely move for all the flowers and the teddy bears and the notes. It was very sad. Was the family well known in that community or were they more of sort of a quiet family that kept to themselves? I think they were fairly well known. They all had friends around the the neighbourhood and friends from school, that sort of thing. Olga, like I said before, was very popular at work, very well liked. So they were just a normal family. In the months after the deaths of Jack and Jennifer, what was known of how Olga was coping? As you say, as she was released from hospital and spent some time with friends, and I believe that she spoke to Rosie Batty and a mm. few uh, members of the community, what was the sense of how she was? Devastated. I mean, how could you be anything else? She was just not coping, and I, I don't know how you could cope under those circumstances, frankly. Her mother came out from Russia to spend some time with her and help her through and sort of, I guess, try to help her grieve, which is pretty futile, honestly. 
But her mother came and she was here for, I think, three or four months and then Olga was planning to pack up the house and said she'd go, said she'd go back to Russia with her mother but never did. This was a story that, that really shook the community and Australia more broadly in July, but we were brought into the story again in December. What happened to Olga at the end of 2018? I just don't think she could cope anymore. I didn't actually cover that bit, but I'm told that she was very depressed. She wasn't leaving her house. She wasn't eating. She just had the blind shut all the time. And then she just couldn't cope. We have some further sad news on a family tragedy. You may remember the West Pennant Hills father, John Edwards, who shot dead his children, Jack and Jennifer, in July before taking his own life. Now, police have confirmed the body of their mother, Olga Edwards, has been found with no suspicious circumstances. If you feel you're not coping, please call Lifeline on 131114. After her death in December, I think there was another conversation that ensued about the fact that John Edwards had three lives on his hands, like Mm. that three people had been killed. What did you make of that? I know that it's really uncomfortable as a journalist in these circumstances because it was so clear why she couldn't cope Mm. as well. But what did you make of that narrative at the time? Well, yeah, I don't think that you can really argue with that, can you? Like if he hadn't done that, then they'd all be happy, healthy, leaving normal lives. And if he hadn't murdered her two kids, then she would probably Mm. still be alive. Did you have any thoughts about the coverage at the time, the way that it was covered? Because Australia has an, you know, an interesting history with cases like this and not necessarily in this case, but Jeff Hunt is one mm. where I think it was interesting in that it was almost like this good guy who snapped narrative. And the word snapped was used mm. in, in this context too. What did you think overall of the reporting? I thought it was quite good actually. I mean, I think this is an interesting question because I'm not sure what people want us to do with information that we're told if they don't like it. Yeah. Like I'm not sure if someone did say, and no one did tell me this, like I want to be clear that that's not what I was ever told, that he was, no one ever said, oh, he was a great guy, I can't believe this has happened. But when people do say that, I'm not clear what they want from journalists. Like I'm not sure if they want us to censor that or to lie and say that was not what we were told. I'm not, anyway, that's a, that's a wider question. But in terms of this, I think the reporting was very fair. It was quite sensitive. No one was knocking on Olga's work door saying, what, how do you feel? Are you Okay. Mm. insofar as I know anyway. Do you think it would have been different if it happened somewhere other than Australia? Because I know that the attitude in the UK or even in the States sometimes towards victims can be a little bit more invasive. I think there is more of a culture of respect Mm. in Australia. Have you found that? Yeah, I think if you read the British tabloids, it's fairly clear that everyone's fair game. And I mean, that's what we learned from the phone hacking scandal, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're in the news, then you are in the news whether you want to be or not. And that's often the case here too. We're certainly not perfect. We certainly don't cover everything perfectly ever. But I do think that the reporting on this case was quite fair and quite sensitive. And as you said, there was no mention of the good bloke narrative. There was no suggestion that he was just this great guy that had been pushed to the edge or anything Mm. like that. I thought it was quite fair. Was there a discussion in the reporting of mental illness? Because often that does come up, especially with a perpetrator, because you Mm. would expect that someone who perpetrates a crime like this isn't reacting in a sensible or understandable or logical way to any events. Was there a suggestion of mental illness? Not that I ever heard. He could well have been mentally ill. I don't know. That didn't come up in this particular instance. It often does, as you say, with criminal proceedings because the two are so sort of side by side that often there are mental health issues in crime reporting. But in this particular case, to my knowledge at least, there weren't any. Do you think that there's anything that can be learned from a case like this? In your reporting, when when you cover it, and it is something so distressing but so important for a lot of reasons, what do you think can be learned from a case like this? I think that the way that people are given gun licences in this state probably needs to be reassessed. And to be fair, in the days after the tragedy, Troy Grant, the former police minister, met with the police commissioner to discuss the ways that they could avert further tragedies like this. And I do think that that was really like a very important step and a very good way of, I don't want to say honouring, that's not quite right, but I think that that was probably like a respectful response to something like this. And to addressing it in a Mm. practical way. Exactly, yeah. 
The shooting murder of two West Pennant Hills teenagers by their father today brought the issue of gun control firmly to the table. It was the central point of discussion at a meeting between the police minister and the commissioner, both now considering a range of possible reforms. We're taking it extremely seriously that we're going to do what's necessary and get it right. If there's information out there that I could have used to knock back his firearm licence, to suspend it, then I need to get access to that. But even Commissioner Fuller admits it's complex, especially when it comes to family violence. Yes, firearms has played a role in this, but we know there are all forms of violence. So let's not forget what the cause of this is all about. And when it comes to getting the family court involved... I have today written to the Federal Attorney General seeking as early as possible an opportunity to sit down and discuss uh, what can be done. This interview was conducted in 2019. An inquest into the murders of Jack and Jennifer Edwards in 2021 handed down 25 formal recommendations. They included better training for New South Wales police officers handling domestic violence reports, better information sharing between the Federal Family Court and New South Wales Firearms Registry, and better risk assessment for registry staff giving people firearms licences. The changes were mostly adopted. New South Wales Police supported all five recommendations directed at them, announcing specific training related to DV. The Firearms Registry also supported their recommendations, announcing major changes. They added domestic violence offences to firearm disqualification regulations and new systems to consider domestic violence offences when granting gun licences. Police officers and child welfare officials became embedded in most family court registries to provide real-time details of domestic violence. Judges reported that the change meant they were able to make decisions more quickly and with the full knowledge of what's been happening. But as the positive changes were announced in the latter half of 2021, advocates were clear. It's important these changes are part of a wider process and not the conclusion on discussions of structural issues linked to DV. As we know, in 2024, we're dealing with plenty of other holes that need plugging. In this case, we're also only talking about changes to one state's systems. We've got so much more to do. At the time of reporting, 35 women have been killed this year alone. Many had AVOs and DVOs out on their partners. Many were known to police. We've got so much more to do. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of True Crime Conversations, which was hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Mamma Mia has partnered with the charity Rise Up Australia. Their mission is to deliver life-changing and practical support to families experiencing domestic and family violence. If you'd like to support them, you'll find a link in our show notes. And if this episode has brought up anything for you or you just feel like you need to speak to someone, please call 1800RESPECT on 1800 737 732. I'll be back next week as we continue to revisit domestic and family violence cases from our archives.